mercy you pulled me in when i had given up you never quit when i couldn't trust you you proved me wrong when i was a stranger you brought me home when i couldn't reach you you pulled me in when i Hi, I'm glad you're here. I'm Pastor Tom Sharp from Sonora, California. And again, some of you have listened to us before. I'm sure that you're out there. Uh, but we're close to the Sierra Nevada mountains, close to Yosemite, outside of Modesto. You may not know Modesto, but I think if you go another 120 miles just west of here, you hit San Francisco. We're glad that you're here with us. And why is it good to be here? Because today we're going to look at uh, from the book of John, chapter 8, freedom, a huge issue for people in the United States, throughout Europe, and throughout the world. I think most people would say they want to be free. Freedom is a huge issue that Christ has come to bring upon the earth. Freedom has to do with how God wants to set us free. And again, we'll talk about, well, not again, for the first time I'm saying, talk about slavery today, and its opposite is freedom. So we believe that the Holy Spirit works of the Word. We're glad that you're here. Just want to say to you, um, we can't see you. <laughs> I can't see you right now, but you can see me. Hey, just let us know that you're here. Uh, if you feel that this message today is going to be helpful and you wish for the sake of what God wants to do in the world and the mission um, to share it, uh, we'd appreciate that, but we say no pressure. If you are here just out of curiosity, we would say you're one of our honored guests, and I admire your openness uh, to want to learn about views that you may not have in your own life and uh, that you're open to hearing what does Jesus have to say. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, and finally, I want to say, if you see our For the Curious messages out there floating on the web, these are three-minute uh, messages. Mainly they go through Facebook, but we have them on YouTube too. Uh, and you would like to share those, we would appreciate that. And if you haven't subscribed to those, you can hit like, subscribe, and follow, and you'll get two new a week. But we're glad you're here now. So let's get into what we're talking about here today and what God wants to talk about with freedom. Uh, Reformation weekend is coming up. Reformation is a time when the church moved from being of one focus to now a new focus. And uh, where did that come from and how did it start? It started with a young man. I think it could have been 1517, I don't know. Uh, the exact date. Uh, this man is named Martin Luther. He was in a, um, or he was going to school, sent by his father to become a lawyer. He was coming home. I don't think anybody knows why he was coming home, but he did. Uh, he was on his horse, riding through, I believe, uh, in my mind anyway, it's this big field. And all of a sudden, the clouds uh, started to move in, and they were gray, and the weather was going to change in Germany. 
And so he rode down, and then all of a sudden he started to hear thunder in the distance, lightning in the distance, and he's on his horse riding through when, boom, one comes so darn close, such a big crack, he flies off his horse. He is scared. He calls out to God. Save me, God. I will become a monk. Somewhere in his psyche, he knew that the God who created this world wants me to do good things so I can make him happy. And he stuck to his word. Father wasn't too crazy about this whole idea after saving up throughout his lifetime for his son Martin to become a lawyer. But he went into the Augustinian monastery. Augustinian monastery was like a ratchet up in terms of the ascetic life. You know, that you really had to do what you did because uh, this is what God requires of you. You know, if you wanted a lesser road, I don't know what the, an option would be. You know, uh, the Dominicans, I don't, maybe the Dominicans would argue with that, uh, that they're not as strict. But he goes into this Augustinian monastery and he learns this is what God expects of you. a lot of drive this Martin and he was determined I'm going to do what's going to please God he worked and he worked and he worked at it and something inside of him would say no not good enough well, he would double down and work and work and work at it and he learned, as he knew his whole life, well, if you're failing and failing and failing, God will help with that. You need to go to confession. So he would go to confession. And he'd there, and then he'd talk about his sins, and then he would get up, they would give him absolution, he would leave, and before he would get down the hallway, I think something to that effect, he'd turn right back around because he'd see it again. Failure, failure, failure. It pushed him, I believe, psychologically to the brink. Because the law was always accusing. He had his mentor there, Father Stalpitz, who was trying to get him to calm down and let go. I think he was even getting on people's nerves there. They would think, oh man, here comes Martin again to confession, and he just won't stop. He could be here all day with us, and we don't want to continue to hear it. This man's experience changed the world. Because God showed him a truth that he wants to show to all of humanity. And the truth that God wants to show to all of us in, who are human beings on the planet from that time after the resurrection of Christ, even before, that our life is meant to be lived by grace. The foundation of our life is not in what we do, but is what's been done for us. When we are set free from what we do, we experience freedom. And God, point number one here today, wants us to be free. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Only in John. Well, there are sprinklings of it in other text also. How do you get free in your life? What is this freedom? Now these people are hearing this for the first time. And how do you get to a place of being free? If you know you're free, which these, we're going to see that they struggled with this idea. Well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we're slaves, we're not free. Getting to a place of freedom depends upon what you hold on to in your life. What Jesus is saying, hold on to my word and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
Now, I will say this. That we have been set free in Christ. Now, if you're not there yet, and you're watching here today, that's where you're at. That's okay. Okay? Look. This young monk was baptized as he was struggling with these issues in that monastery. It is in God's grace given to him in baptism that he had the freedom, but he didn't know he had the freedom. It had to do with what he was clinging to in his life. And what he was clinging to in his life was his performance about what he needed to do to please God. He wanted to be okay. He wanted to be right with God. He wanted a sense of security that comes out of that relationship. And his psyche, as I would say most of us, our DNA is wired, would be do good and get something. I mean, that's how we make a living today. Life is not a two-way street. You've got to do your stuff. And it's all about do, do, do. But the path of doing and doing and doing throughout life leads us into slavery. So what, what's the argument here? The argument is that we have something. The question is, is, do we know we have it? Something that God has given to all of us. And that is left for discovery. And how do you discover? Jesus says, if you hold on to my truth, to my word, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So even if you get to a place in your life where you're just clinging to um, what is God's rules? What are the Ten Commandments? What do I got to do? How I got to perform? And you hold on and hold on to that and you get knocked on your rear again and again. God would be saying you're on the way to discovering the freedom in which I have given you. I believe it doesn't happen that way for most people. It happens in other ways because there's a reason that we grab hold of what we grab hold of in this life. And we do that because of our needs. And so we find that which makes our life work. Now let's go ahead. We're going to just launch it off to the second point here. Okay. Knowing our bondage comes before freedom. Okay? How do you get to this place of saying, yeah, I'm free. Well, if you don't know you're in slavery, then you'll never know what it means to be free. You know, and perhaps some people get to this because if they've been witnessed to, you know, witnessed not just with words, of course, at work sometimes, but seeing other people that have a sense of peace in their life when they don't. I've heard it happening that way and say, there's something that I'm missing in life if I feel the way I do. Um, but learning to understand yourself, understand your bondage, becomes essential. Because nothing in your life is going to change. Nothing in my life is going to change unless I'm able to acknowledge it. All right, now, how does it go down in the discussion here today with John chapter 8? They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. See, now, this is, this is a weird discussion here, okay? And I, it just coming to me now, but, you know, at that time, they were thinking probably, yeah, I remember I grew up in my family, and uh, we weren't slaves. We knew what slaves were. They, those were those people out there, but it wasn't us. But what, what makes it weird, this statement, is, is that Judaism is built upon freedom from slavery. It was built upon God hearing the cries of the people in the desert in Egypt and uh, sending them Moses to be their leader and God with his mighty hand leading these people out of slavery into freedom. They're confused, you know. So, it, And this is a big deal. It's like uh, for Judaism, you know, what is all the Passover feast about? What are the uh, ceremonies? They're all about how God did this for us. You know, you look at the Ten Commandments. 
you know. Uh, and they're numbered different. As some would say, well, in this church body, we number them wrong because we start with love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. What you do, how you perform, and what you make as a priority in your life. Well, uh, the, the words before that, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. We're going to start there. <laughs> and then <laughs> we'll get into the freedom. So Judaism, or the freedom, or the Ten Commandments, Judaism is about being set free. And they're saying, what, huh, what, you know, yeah. what, what's this guy talking about? We've never been slaves of anyone. But here's where God turns it around, or Jesus turns it around. He says, look, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Everybody who practices slave to, uh, to sin is a slave to sin. So our bondage has to do with this word sin. Now this word gets into uh, missing the mark of life. The two marks of life, actually. Well, actually it could be one, but he throws in the other key essential one, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Love the people he puts in your life like you love yourself. Do that. Never veer from that. And you got it. The problem is nobody gets it. That's what Jesus spent most of those three years doing, is to try to tell people, no, you don't have it. No, you don't have it. No, you don't have it. Kind of even go back into the monastery again, uh, the Augustinian monastery 500 years ago with that young man Luther, and say, nope, you don't got it. Nope, you don't got it. Well, the no, you don't have it, it shows your bondage. Now, what is sin? Sin is taking a hold of something in your life that God gives you and making it more important than the one who gave it, who is God. Now, why would we do such a thing? Every human being who's ever been born in the history of humanity has had to figure out one thing. What is going to make my life work? You come into this life, we don't have everything we need. We need to go after that which we need. If we go after that which we need, and it's not the one true God, 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week, we miss the mark. So we find things to work. You know, I've uh, been in this church for about 20 years as pastor, and I've always liked to ask them, well, what is the number one thing that people use to make their life work, you know? And they usually answer back, and maybe you would know if I could hear you, money. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> um, you know, I think of that song, you, we've got a lot of what it takes to get along, you know? Money is a very sensitive issue, and money is a place where we can look for a sense of security. But we have other needs. We have psychological needs. What's going to make us okay? I would say the classic is what we do. Now, I want to go back again to the monastery. That The rules were the rules there. This is what they were on the wall. And um, this young man, this Martin Luther, he had to, uh, to, to, to be what God wants him to be, follow the rules. Now, I'll argue to you, most people don't live like that. Most people are not going through life as that, oh, I don't know if I please God. I don't know if I please God. Well, how does sin play itself out? Sin plays itself out in what we do. But what we do still would be good works to prove that we're okay. And it can take on a lot of different forms. What makes us okay? Well, let's just let's pick on pastors, okay? Look, you know, I think we know what good pastors do, and what bad pastors do. I'm going to be doing the good that will make me a good pastor. You know? Psychologically, I believe at our depth, we don't ever believe that we have it all right, and that it's never enough, so the law will always accuse us. Well, how do you deal with that? Well, you just focus on something outside of yourself that... Uh, is a bad pastor. <laughs> and so you start to get into judging other people. You know, this whole issue of judging is so important for us because it tells us so much about ourselves. But 
that's just one way. You could do it in the world of business. You can be a mother and build your identity upon it being a mother. Um, you can choose in a lot of different places. You can choose on who you are as a citizen in your community. You, know? you can choose politics. You know, if you don't feel so good about yourself, you join a group and my group's right and my group's going to win and I will feel good when we win or I will feel terrible blow to my self-esteem if we lose. By the way, I put out a, a, a For the Curious on that that should be released in a few weeks. So a watch for that one on how we try to use politics to make ourselves feel good. There are so many different ways this happens. The key to it is that what we need to do in this life is find something to hold on to that's going to make us feel okay. If we didn't all feel okay and we were lousy, could you imagine what the suicide rate would be? There is something in all of us that says to survive. Find what you need to survive. And if anybody messes what you need to survive, you attack or you run away. I don't want to be around those kind of people. Boy, I think I've said it about three weeks in a row now. I'm ready to say it again. This is very important. You know, what ticks you off? Can, if you want to find out what makes you tick, find out what ticks you off. What do you cling to to make your life work? Why is getting mad so important? Because it tells you something about yourself. Why is judgment about those people who get it wrong are so important? It tells you something about yourself. The problem is, the problem is, the problem is, we believe that it's really out there. And the longer that we believe those kinds of things, the more we stay in bondage to our own slave and our slavery and our own depravity. Freedom comes by understanding our bondage understanding what makes our life work, understanding our idols in this world. Because unless those things that chain our life are spotted and understood, we will never move to the full freedom. Now, I'm going to go back here, all right? Here's the deal. <laughs> we already have this stuff in Christ. Will we ever be totally free? I would say no, but yes. What God is trying to say to us is that I've got you covered. You want to get into foolishness and believe your life is all about you? You want to get into foolishness and continue to cling to things that you really need to let go of? I've got you covered. Now people would say, well, what the heck is that? You know, if you just tell people, well, it doesn't matter. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose again for you. You just do whatever the heck you want because the, 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 the understanding there is all about law. If you give to people, then they will just say the heck with it. Then I'm just going to go out and eat, drink, and be merry, and my life will have no purpose. Well, eating, drinking, merry is a good part of life that God has given us to join, uh, to, to enjoy. This freedom sets us free to a new life. This freedom can come in a large kaboom. Wow, I get it, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, not a power of uh, joining an institution or having some pastor tell you what it is, but getting it between you and your God. That can happen. But even if that does happen where you say, wow, kind of like we mentioned last week, the Amazing grace, the moment I first believed, everything was opened up. Um, you can have those, but still, there's always going to be this sinful nature within all of us that's going to bring us to slavery. God wants to reveal those things to us by the power of his Holy Spirit to move us to new places. And the new place that he moves us and he wants us to know that we are a part of, because we have been covered in Christ, who died for us, who rose again for us, he wants to let us know that we have freedom now. And that freedom makes us a part of God's family. This is the way it's described in 35 and 36. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, 
you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If my church denomination sets me free, I will be free indeed. If the pastor that I like sets me free, I will be free indeed. And today in America, it's like, hey, if you join our political party, it just shows that finally you have found the truth and the truth has set you free. Kind of reminds me of those old education camps the communists would put on. And after a while, someone would say, I get it now. It's all about the people. And they hug them and say, welcome to the freedom. You're one of the boys now. When the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free in the family. Whether you get it or whether you struggle with it. That none of us were going to totally get it. But God's got it for us. And it's there to discover. It's there to discover in our bondage. We are members of the family. What do we know about families today? Is there anybody here, or I'm saying here, <laughs> believing that you're here, <laughs> whenever you listen to the recording? I mean, how important has your family been to you? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking, oh, they were so good and they loved me. That doesn't work for everybody. Some families, uh, the, the parents were really in bondage and they could not even get beyond their bondage to love their children like they should. And that would include all families to some extent. But what I'm getting at here is basically what shapes us as human beings. What shapes us the most in the human experience is the family of origin that we come from. What God is telling us is I've adopted you into my family. And slaves are temporary. Because, why? They're not family. Not you. Not you. Not me. God makes us his sons and daughters. Set free through the blood of Christ. Were you influenced by your family of origin? Some people have successfully left behind dysfunctional families. Some have not. They've just moved on down the road with their dysfunction, which I think, again, it includes all of us at a more and less level. Because they're influence. Your heavenly father is now your heavenly father. And you have influence in your life from your heavenly father. About do this, do this, do this? Mm, not really, to some extent. But about being set free to be people of God. Having freedom to serve God. To say God matters. Freedom that says, I've been covered through Christ. Shall I live a self-indulged life where I'm just kind of feasting and enjoying and just it's all about me and satisfying my senses? No, that's slavery. Freedom. Freedom to live the life that God has called you to live upon the earth. Freedom that you have been given, whether you know it or not, as a baptized Christian of God. Freedom that comes, not through what we do, but what's been done for us in Christ. What's God's message to the world? It's right there. So I say at this point, amen on that. Let's move on to the prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, you make us your children. You give us freedom through your Son. And you say we are no longer slaves, slaves to sin, but now we are freedom, free in being a part of your family, sons and daughters. 
Father, may that freedom move our lives forward. May we uh, in, look to the inside, look into the dark places of our souls, and look for those places that we cling to or that we found meaning and hope and making our life work that are not of you. Let us put those things in proper perspective and make you the Father, the King of our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, your Son has spoken to us and has told us to pray and pray continually. So we pray and bring before you COVID-19 as we continue to struggle uh, throughout the world. Again, we ask for strength and power for those who are serving those who are sick. We ask that you would hear those who cry out to you in prayer. We ask that you would comfort those who grieve. And dear Heavenly Father, for our friends in Ireland, as we send out the message of your Son to this nation, we ask that your Holy Spirit would lead people to know what you've done for them in Ireland. Bless them, restore them, and strengthen them. And let your Holy Spirit touch this land, as well as for the rest of the places that we send your message out. And thank you for that privilege. And dear Heavenly Father, for our online community, we ask that you would hear the prayers of those who call upon our prayer team. And that as their names are brought before your throne, you would hear them and that you would give the request as you've encouraged us to come to you. And Father, in our own community here and those connected with this community, we bring before you. We bring Dorothy Kanigi before you as she struggles with Alzheimer's, with Charlotte Frazier, who has cancer, Zach Geish, who waits for a kidney, Judy Fisher, who has cancer, and Floyd Krause, who is in hospice. Father, for Dorothy, Charlotte, Zach, and Judy, and Floyd, Watch over them, bless them, take care of them. Into your hands do we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Amen. And it's offering time. I want to encourage you, not as a slave, but as a free person. Free to give. Free to give because your Father gives to you. Um, to give to give to your church. And I, I know I say this often if you're a regular uh, visitor of us, that uh, if you have a home church, to give to your home church and its mission and ministry there. If you don't have a home church and you would like to go on to our website and press the donation button, um, I encourage you again to give by free freedom and faith. We would appreciate that, that this church would continue to be a lifeline um, to our community and to the world, as uh, so many of you are part of that world that's way beyond. We're glad you're here again, though. And you have a life to live, and I have a life to live. We have a freedom that has been given us in Christ Jesus. We have a bondage that we've received in our sinful nature. But we see the freedom when we see the bondage. We become set free from the bondage. So on your life journey, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you and your life his peace. Amen. Thank you again. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for walking with us uh, in this short, I don't know, what has it been, 40 minutes or so? Again, I want to encourage you, if the message here about how God brings freedom would help some of your friends on your friends list, you'd like to share this, you can. Uh, we will be having a live stream service at 1030 on um, this Sunday, East, not Eastern Standard Time, Pacific Standard Time, so wherever you are in the world. I want to say that uh, if you are within a certain range of St. Matthew Lutheran Church and you'd like to come, we'd love to meet you. So um, we know many people today will watch much more video before they come and visit a church. Also, I want to end in saying to you that uh, we are looking for people that want to pray in this church. We're looking for people that want to pray throughout the world uh, for whatever the issues are that people on this planet are dealing with. 
If you would like to be a part of our prayer team, let us know down below uh, our website. Uh, get a hold of us there. And um, we are gathering together people who pray. Dear friends, thank you. God's peace be with all of you. Well, I hope to see you next week. And you can come and join us with our live out stream. Live stream. Our live out stream. <laughs>